I know, I didn't give you another sheet. Okay. Wait a minute, no. We're in the after the resurrection. What are you talking about? Oh, that was, no, that was like three, I'm like three weeks behind. Okay. 20, sorry. We talked about the clothes lying there, the face cloth, Mary stood weeping at the tomb. Whom are you seeking? We talked about the gardener, right? And Rabboni. And she said, oh, on the evening of that day, right? Yeah, we just, just started. 19. I did it. I said verse 19. I just said the wrong chapter. Did you find the milk cows? Milk kind. It is? You found it? Right there. Milk kine. Kine. What is a kine? That is interesting. Well, no, it's fine. I think you're right. It's kine. Cows. That's plural for cows. Kine. <laughs> Who even knew? There's cow. And then plural cow is kine. Emeralds. Yeah, I know. But the English plural is kine. Isn't that weird? Do we do we get our counters? Are they coming? Did we lose our counters? Did they have to take off? It was a long service. They walked out. They walked out on me. All right. Well, that's okay. We have who we have. That's fine. So. Uh, let's read. Anybody? Leah, you read. You haven't read for a while. Verse 19. Mm, nice and loud. Uh, through what you see on the screen. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked, the disciples were prepared because Jesus came and stood among them and said, Let peace be with you. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. When he said this, he greeted them, and then said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone, they are forgiven. Way to mumble the whole ending. You even know that part by heart. Yeah, Office of the Keys. John chapter 20, right? Whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven them. Whoever sins you with, you retain, they are retained. I don't know what translation you learned it. You know what I mean? Yeah, it sounds the same. Same idea. Okay. So a couple things that he says here. Um, oh, this might be relevant to what you heard in the sermon today. <laughs> Doors being locked for fear of the Jews. They're, they're, they're actually afraid of their own brothers and sisters. But what can they do to them? Brothers and sisters by, by blood. Brothers by blood. What can they do to them? What, what can the Jews do to these disciples? They were probably afraid of Jesus. Hmm? That's exactly what they're afraid of. They can do anything. But they had heard Jesus tell them on more than one occasion, whoever desires to save his life must lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake in the gospel will receive it into eternal life. Yeah, so the idea of fearing death, especially this kind of, I mean, they're fearful death because of who they believe in, who they trust in. Right? So this is a fear of death that's based upon their confession of Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah. Right? Now, just to, just to nuance the sermon a little bit, um, you know, fearing a virus is, it's fair enough because it can destroy the body, right? Sure. Um, but as Jesus says, do not fear the one who can destroy the body, but fear the one who can lead the body and soul into hell. Right? So that was the, that's always the conflict. You say, okay, you have got a virus and it's a reasonable threat to your body. But we have to weigh that against the threat to your, to your spiritual well-being, right? And say, well, okay, given that, what do I, how, how am I going to preserve my faith if I can't gather with other Christians to hear God's word, right? We tried to, we tried to approximate it with the, with the online services. I don't know how well it worked. I found them, well, one, they're a lot of work, actually. But um, what this, the analytics proved, by the way, is that after five weeks, almost everybody that watched consistently dropped off. Yeah. Yeah, it only took five weeks. It took just about a month. The online services. Our numbers were going, they initially, like the first couple weeks, they'd be here. By week five, we lost more than half of them. And then, and then they stalled after that. Yeah. Now, there are people who faithfully watch every week online. So I don't want to... 
I don't know who they are, but I, the total number of what? Yeah, yeah, no, there's analytics. But this is true in real life too, not just in virtual life, right? If you don't show up to church for a month, that's pretty much it. And this is true with anything. You stop brushing your teeth for five days. <laughs> it's really hard to get going again. I mean, five days. Now, none of you have tried this, right? You've not experimented with this? Okay. Okay, Beryl. <laughs> but like, if you wanted something to be a regular habit, it only takes five times of skipping that habit before you're just like, Psh. like I was off my bike for two weeks. Bye, Jim. I was off my bike for two weeks because it was broken. A little over two weeks. I think it was like almost two and a half weeks. And then starting up again this last week was oh, not fun. <clears throat> not fun at all. All right, why did I bring this up? Oh, for fear of the Jews, right. So they're, they're fearful of their life, right? But the, their, the fear of their life is based upon the fear of what, why the Jews will kill them, which is namely, they don't, I don't, maybe they don't want to be put, Peter especially doesn't want to be back in that same situation again, where he's forced to say, I'm a disciple of Jesus, and then go with Jesus to the cross. Even though he had said he would do that, then when push comes to shove. So, I mean, they're fearful. Um, and uh, this is an interesting thought, but for fear of the Jews. So is the Bible anti-Semitic? Is the Bible anti-Semitic? I don't even know what that means. What does anti-Semitic mean? Yeah, against the Jews. In one sense it is, okay? In one sense it is. It's against um, the spiritual notion that Jesus isn't the Messiah, which is what the Jews still hold today. So there's, there's always going to be a spiritual conflict. Jews who believe, Jews who don't. That was largely Luther's conflict with the Jews, but people miss the nuance on that. I, he, Luther wasn't too terribly nuanced anyway, so that doesn't help. You know Luther is considered like the anti-Semite because Hitler co-opted his writing on, on the Jew and their, Jews and their lies, <laughs> which is a great title, right? On the Jews and their lies. Uh, we did a review of that work for banned books, by the way. So you can go and listen to it. So probably our one of our top five episodes as far as people watching it. And there's all sorts of comments on YouTube, people hating it, how we tried to actually defend Luther, even though we said multiple times it's indefensible. They said, yeah, you're trying to, yeah, whatever. Um, he was a cranky old man. Uh, but on the other, sen on the other hand, the, the Bible's entirely not anti-Semitic because as Paul is very clear, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, right? Before God, before, in regards to salvation, and none of that actually matters. You're, you're Jewish or Christian, hand, I mean, whatever ancestry you have, that's not the point. It's baptism, right? That makes you a child of God? Of course, people take that reading totally out of context. What do you mean? Without context, they may think, oh, so there is nothing at all. There's no male or female at all. Oh, I see. Luther's saying, or, sorry, me. I'm not going to call you Luther. Ethan is saying that, um, that Paul is saying that there is no such thing as sex, gender. No, I'm saying... <laughs> Right. But ironically, then they want to read, they want to read race into everything. The same people who say there's no such thing as, as gender binary then say, that, but everybody's a racist. And you're like, well, you can't have it both ways. <laughs> or you can, maybe, I guess. Uh, that's before the world, though, right? This is the key. Before God, before the world. Before God, there's no distinction. Male nor female, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, etc. Right? Before the world, of course there's di differences. Your ancestry is part of who you are. Right? Your, your sex you know, assigned at birth by God, <laughs> is part of who you are. You can try to change it, but good luck with that. <laughs> well, I, I suppose our future governor of California has tried substantially. Uh, all right. Uh, he came and stood among them and said to them, after climbing in through the window, uh, what? Well, there had to have been a window. How else would he have gotten in? The doors were locked. Right, okay. Thanks. Yeah, John Calvin is notorious for that. There's, there's people before him, though. We want to be fair to Calvin. Um, a lot of people have actually used this text then to, dis, to, to defend the idea that, of what's called the communication of attributes. Does that sound exciting? That's right. That's, what you, that's when you fall asleep in class. The communicatio idiomatum and the apostolicum and the myostiticum. Okay, anyway. There's three categories. It's a, it's a dogmatic idea. Basically, here's the idea. I'll just simplify it. I did this on a daily prayer a while ago, that Jesus is true God and true man, right? right? There's certain 
attributes of, of being a, a man, right, that are not at all like being God, right? Because God can be in more than one place at a time. Um, God fills all things. What else? He's all powerful, et cetera, et cetera, right? He can, God commands the sea and the waves, right? God brought all things into being by a word. He can give healing. People, people are restrained, right? You can only be in one place at a time. You're limited to your, your body. Your body can only do the things that bodies can do, right? Uh, and then, of course, we meet Jesus, and, and it gets a little bit more confusing, right? Because Jesus, the man, stands in the boat and stills the storm, tells the, rebukes the storm, tells the waves to stop, which is only something God can do, right? That's a unique attribute of God. Man, well, some would argue that actually Adam, the first Adam, before the fall into sin, had that ability to command creation in the way that God does. It's an interesting thought, right? Well, I mean, he can name the animals. So like he could walk around and say, let there be flower, and then there'd be flowers. Wouldn't that be lovely to walk around? Yeah. Be like, I need an apple. There's an apple. I, I, I don't disagree with that because without the fall, man did not have it. But it's, it's ultimately speculation. Although we do have Jesus coming up to the fig tree and say, bear figs, and coming back later and has no figs and cursing it. So, you know, that's also showing that creation doesn't always listen. Because of the fall into sin. It doesn't say. It doesn't say. Everybody thinks it's an apple. I like the idea that it's a fig tree, yes. Because of the fig tree, yeah. Because of the fig tree and the fig leaves. That's right. I like the idea of it being figs. And then you could have figgy pudding. Okay. I don't know. I, have I ever had figgy pudding? I don't know. It's in that song. Okay. <laughs> Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Um, this, is a, this is a Hebrew greeting, right? This is how Jews would greet. Shalom. Shalom, right? Or as Spock says, live long and prosper. Okay? That's the same thing, by the way. Because he just co-opted a thing that he saw in synagogue and used it in Star Trek. This is the Hebrew character, Sheen. It's the first, word of sh first letter of Shalom. Now you know. There's a little bit of... A little bit of uh, Hebrew in the Star Trek. Anyway, uh, shalom, peace be with you, right? And some uh, uh, Arabs do this today, salam. It's the same word, right? And that's their greeting. We say hello. They say salam or shalom, right? And it means peace. Generally, you don't greet somebody unless they're not going to kill you, and, you know, right? So if you say peace, you're actually saying we're at peace. You're declaring what's true. Make sense? What are you going to say? Yeah, well, Jerusalem is what? Salem was city of peace, right? Jerusalem, city of peace. That's right. Um, peace be with you. Uh, it's more than just peace. Think about all the times we hear that word peace in the divine service. It's pretty profound because we give that, I give that full dismissal after the supper. We're all together, right? Instead of each table like we were doing before. And then also, again, at the end, you keep hearing it at the end of the service, peace be with you, peace, peace to you, right? We heard it at the beginning, too, at the baptism, you know, before uh, Arthur went back to his seat, right? Peace be with you, right? It's the word of forgiveness is what it is. Your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. That's the only way you can leave in it. That's the only way you can have any peace, by the way. <laughs> Think about, like, all the things we're afraid of and all the things that could hurt and harm us. The only way you can live in this, this world with any sense of peace is knowing Knowing what? That there's forgiveness of sins. That Jesus has overcome the world. Yeah, a great example of that is the uh, hosts in the Say it loudly so everybody can hear you, mumbler. <laughs> great example of that. Is that was gentle, by the way. The host sermon, um, pronouncing not the right word, but the peace of God. The votum. Yeah, the peace of God. It's a quote from Paul. Guard the your hearts and minds. Anyway. Peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Guard your hearts and minds, right? All right, it's, the, it's namely that in, in the proclamation of the gospel, you heard that your sins are forgiven, right? You have peace in Jesus. He doesn't always just come out and, blatantly, and just forwardly say forgiveness. You're forgiven, right? It comes in different ways, right? Jesus has overcome the world. Well, that's another way of saying your sins are forgiven because you're part of the world. Okay. So that's what he's saying. Peace to you, which is really good. Peace be with you, passive. And then, this is cool, he showed them his hands and his side. Now the other gospels say they showed him his hands and his feet. 
But here he shows him his hands and his side, which I think is important because um, John make, has made an emphasis of the spear, right? That the others didn't have the spear going in his side. And then First John, John's first epistle, talks about the three witnesses, right? The blood, the water, and the spirit. And these three testify, right? So there is this unique emphasis on his side. And then note, they were glad when they saw the Lord. So where does faith come from? No, it comes from seeing. Yeah, they saw, he showed him his hands and his side. <laughs> they were glad when they saw the Lord. Yeah, no, they saw, they saw with their eyes, but, they, but notice, this is always how it works. There's always, this has been the case through all of John's gospel. There's been signs, but the only way the sign gave faith was coupled with God's word. Coupled with God's word. So he showed them his hands and his side, but he said, these are the signs of peace, right? I have overcome sin. See? <laughs> I died. I shed my blood, right? I'm the Passover lamb, however you want to look at it. Does that make sense? So, yeah, I was just agreeing with you, Eileen. I was just giving you a hard time. Yeah, no, faith comes by hearing. It's absolutely true, right? But he's going to get to this with Thomas. We just heard this, what, two, three weeks ago? Yeah, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. But they see, and the sea is the sign, and then they're, they're now the eyewitnesses, right, of the resurrection. But they're our eyewitnesses. They testify for us and to us of what they saw, right? So it is important that someone, and actually many people saw, 1 Corinthians 16, I think, says, or is it 15? 16, I think, says that there were, um, he appeared to the 12, and he appeared to 500 at one time. When we went through 1 Corinthians, we talked about that on the evening Bible study. It's like, where's that? It's not anywhere else in the Bible. Apparently, there was a big party and he showed up. Or something. I don't know. When else do you have 500 people? Probably a wedding. Another wedding. Weddings have, I don't know, 500 people at a wedding? Ascension? Just the 12? Well, they're called the 12, but obviously they're missing a couple. Yeah, apparently. I don't know. I mean, this, no, these are post-death post and ascension, resurrection. People he appeared to after his resurrection. I, Paul, Paul knows something we don't know about. Right? Not everything's recorded. That's okay. Anyway, so yeah, it's, it's seeing coupled with, with the words. And then he says to them again, peace be with you. And then here is, all right, so I, I pulled out a hypercritical commentary for the la end of the book. And I was reading this yesterday. This is from Arthur Brown. No, Raymond Brown. Actually, it's really good. I've forgotten how good it was. But it's also like, he tells you everything that everybody gets wrong about everything. <laughs> so it gets a little fatiguing after a while. Because he's like, well, there's some people who say that this is what this is all about. But then there's some people who say this is what it's about. And then there's other people who disagree. And then, actually, I don't agree with any of them. I have my own idea. And you're like, oh, geez. Well, how am I supposed to actually understand what this is meaning? If... Which is fair enough. But um, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. Your sins are forgiven. And then, as the Father hath sent me, even so I'm sending you. Um, so Mr. Brown said that this is not the institution of the office of the ministry, the holy ministry, which is a problem because the word for sending is, anybody know? Oh, yeah. I'm going to just impress you a little bit with a little Greek, right? Apostello, from which we get apostle, right? Apostle. He's saying, as the Father has apostled me, so now I'm apostling you. That's sent one, right. Are they, they were disciples, followers, but now they are sent ones, right? They, were, they followed, now they can be, having followed and received the word and the, and the eyewitness testimony, now they can be sent. And notice that they're sent, not alone, but with the Holy Spirit. Jesus breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. All right, so now there's all these more arguments. Again, you can read Mr. Brown if you want. You can borrow this and, again, snooze fest, fall asleep. Um, well, but wait a minute. They don't get the Holy Spirit until Pentecost. How can they get the Holy Spirit in, the, in this house with the locked doors? Because Jesus breathed it on them. Well, he couldn't have done it more than once. Sure what? Yeah, no, um, 
I'm trying to think of another example of this. Oh, like the cleansing of the temple was an example, right? It was done early in the ministry according to the synoptics, but then it was done during Holy Week according to John. I'm like, well, which is it? Well, he did it, right? Which, whichever place it has in the story is just dependent upon what the storyteller is trying to convey as far as the events. Remember, this is, we have this weird scientific view of history today where everything has to be... Right? But if any of you have told a story about something kind of you know, substantial in your life, you probably yeah, conflate the details and you move around a little bit. You don't quite tell it perfectly accurately, right? Like that time, my mom always tells the story about that time I got shot at, which isn't really what happened, but it's a much better story. What? There was what we suspect was a gunshot. We can't even confirm it was a gunshot. But it turned into we were shot at by a hunter or something. Yeah, anyway. My mother's an li- elementary school librarian, so she is by her very nature a... Well, she, then she worked to middle school, but it's the same idea. She's a storyteller. That's what you do. That's what storytellers do, right? The details aren't really the point. The details just further the, the they, point. They, um, they, catch your they catch your attention and your imagination, right? So uh, the same point here. Did they receive the spirit of Pentecost? Absolutely. 5,000. Read it, read it in, in the book of Acts, chapter 2. Did they receive the spirit... In the, in the locked room from Jesus? Yeah. What's the problem? Well, here's the problem. Do you, get the, do you receive the Holy Spirit more than once? When? Baptism. Baptism. Good. When else? Any other time? When does Jesus breathe on you? Yeah, the Spirit comes alongside His Word. So every time you hear His Word, you're receiving the Spirit. The Roman church actually has what they call the sevenfold gifts of the Spirit. We even sing about it in one hymn. But we don't recognize the sevenfold gifts, but we sing about it in a hymn, which is a little confusing. Nobody ever asked me, it's like, Pastor, what? Well, on Pentecost, we'll sing the hymn, and you'll, then you can ask in Bible class, and we'll try to f- look up what the sevenfold gifts are. One of them is ordination. But that's true. In ordination, pastors receive the Holy Spirit. La- their hands, hands are laid on them. They're like, well, wait a minute. Didn't they already have the Spirit in baptism? Confirmation. I don't do it, but some people do. But for the Roman church, definitely, confirmation is a special gift of the Holy Spirit in addition to what they received in baptism. I say it's the same spirit they received in their baptism because it's a man-made right. Ordination, that's actually kind of man-made too. So that's another story for another day maybe. Yeah, no, you get the Holy Spirit all the time. Every time Jesus breathes on you, right? Weddings, yeah, sure. He breathes words on you. That for Rome, I think so, yeah. For them, yeah, weddings is sacrament. That's why weddings are only in the church. Yeah, I actually like to call it holy matrimony to distinguish what we do from what the state does. Because in the Lutheran understanding, you don't have to like it, but it is what it is, um, is that marriage belongs to the state. So they get to define what marriage is. The church only recognizes certain marriages though, right? Male, female. And then they come and they get, I mean, you know, we sign the marriage license. Like, not as part of the ceremony. What we do in church is you hear God's word applied to the promises you make. Right? What, so, in one sense, we don't even need the state. Right? The church can declare married who we declare married and ignore. We don't have to declare married who the state says is married. You know, male, male, female, female, cats and dogs living together, you know, to quote, to quote Ghostbusters. And the interesting thing I last year was, hmm. uh, matrimony is basically mother making matrimony means mother making nice i like it very it's very not patriarchal so that's good i like that all right so gifts of the spirit we receive the spirit all the time every time jesus breathes on us this is old testament stuff right being member of creation we had the adam was formed from the dust and then god breathed life into him right we talked about the ezekiel text which we had a couple weeks ago I think the Sunday, second Sunday of Easter, we had the dry bones, right? Say to these dry bones, breathe on, breathe on these slain, that the breath of life may enter. Come from the four winds and breathe on these slain. Ezekiel 37. Yeah, he's made from clay or dust or earth, whatever. His name means earth. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, 
Is there another time where there's break? Oh, um, doesn't Elijah do this? Breathe on the little girl? I think he does. Oh, he lays on her. That's Elisha. He does. It's mouth to mouth. Yeah, see, CPR is in the Bible. Look at that. But it's true. I mean, yeah, you have to put breath into them. Yeah, yeah. So it's a beautiful thing. Because with breath, there's life. Just like with the blood, there's life. So, so with the breath. Right? And so the, the gift of the Spirit is likened to breath. And of course, remember, the Spirit hovered over the face of the deep. In the beginning. I thought you were going to come and do some kind of stick fighting with me. You, go for it. I'm not going to stop you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. All right, not just any spirit, the Holy Spirit. And then here, again, office of the keys, according to the small catechism, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. All right, so now we say that this applies to the office of the keys, John chapter 20, verse 23, 22, 23, um, belong to the office of the holy ministry and that unique authority that Christ has given to his church on earth forgive the sins of repentant sinners as long as they repent, but to withhold forgiveness from the unrepentant as long as they do not repent. All right? Now, generally speaking, Christians are not given that authority, right? Does Jesus say, don't forgive? Is there times where it's not appropriate to forgive? Yeah, seven times? How about seven times 70 or 77? Yeah, no, that's true. That's a good text for that. Of course, the Lord's Prayer is pretty good on it. <laughs> forgive us as we forgive when we feel like it. Is that how it goes? There was uh, one of the professor at Christ Academy who said that when he approaches that line in the Lord's Prayer is as you're saying that you are actively yeah. forgiving everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Against. yeah. You actually can't ask for forgiveness without forgiving one another. Yeah. And that is the word of forgiveness. Um, by the way, you should say the word of forgiveness to those you're forgiving. Why would you, why was, I mean, it's true that you can forgive in your heart, right? Not hold someone's sins against them. But why would you speak that word of forgiveness to them? First of all, they would hear you. Okay, goes into their ear. Why is that helpful? Then, it, um, then, then they believe it. For the sake of faith. Now, they might not believe it, but they need to hear that there's even a thing called forgiveness of sins. I always tell this to people. Uh, with kids, you know, they always have a hard time. Um, uh, adults actually probably have a harder time, I should say. It's like, don't just say, I'm, it's okay, don't worry about it. You know, say, I forgive you. Because, um, I mean, there are probably times where it's appropriate to just say it's okay, where they haven't actually sinned against you, right? Where there's no sin. But there's, when it is sin, you should forgive it with those words, I forgive you. Because, like Ethan says, those are, words that come, those are words of Jesus that have the Spirit with them and they instill faith when and where He chooses. So, I mean, I've said this with marriage. I could say this with, with community. I think we probably, I mean, we've seen some powerful scenes of this happen in the, in the civil world too. There was a, uh, it was la not last summer, the summer before, I think it was a mother to her child's murderer. This was like in Kansas or something. Like in court, Asked the judge to reconcile with the with with the murderer. I think it was murderer. Yeah, and and said I forgive you to the guy, and the guy broke down. You know, young guy. You know, and he's still going to do the time. That's not, but before God to hear that your sins are forgiven and what that. Think about what encouraging word that would be. You know, as you're facing you know a long time in jail for manslaughter or murder. And the faith she had. Yeah, that confession of faith because it's encouraging. I mean, that story's a couple years old. And it's still encouraging me. And I wasn't even there. I just saw it on TV or in the newspaper or wherever. I don't read newspaper or watch TV. Internet, yes. Yeah. And, and, and she didn't, I mean, maybe she did it intentionally, she, willfully, I mean, I, I, probably. Um, I don't know, if I were in that situation, I, I imagine it would be very hard to do such a thing, right? Um, but what is that? That's actually the power of the Spirit at work, right? Forgive, I as I'm forgiven, I'm going to forgive even this one who took my own child's life. And I say too, if you, if you forgive somebody, that's, like you, you get that relief. You know? Yeah. Yeah, because you get it out. Yeah. It's out. I'm not holding this sin against you. Now, there is the backspin to this, is that if you say I forgive you and they don't believe what they did is a sin, 
they may reject you as a result and say, I didn't do anything wrong, but that's, that's still God's word at, and his spirit at work to reveal sin, right? Well, I'm sorry, um, what you did, I mean, you destroyed my reputation, you hurt my, my livelihood, you, um, you spoke ill of me before others, whatever it was, right? It's like, uh, what remains in the darkness um, remains unforgiven. So that's the other reason why you say I forgive you. And it's hard. I don't do it very often. Um, I mean, I do, it, <laughs> I do it as my job, but in personal life. Um, maybe I'm just blessed to be surrounded by children that never sin against me, and I never sin against them. So everything goes okay. As you said, the even better way to say it is to always say everything in the name of Jesus. Oh, even better. Yeah, add, add Jesus' name to it. Right, because sometimes you will bump into people, um, you know, not if your circle is generally churchy people, but sometimes even churchy people. And they say, well, you can't forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. So if you attach Jesus' name, then you're also indicating the same thing that he did here with the apostles. He's giving them authority, right? You're indicating by what authority you can say, I forgive you your sins in the name of Jesus. He's given me that name, and he, he's told me to apply that name to his word, when I, when I speak his word, and his word is, your sins are forgiven. Which is why we apply it to our prayer. All right, so we got to talk a little bit more about this. Because, uh, again, they're gonna argue, there's a lot of arguments about verse 23, according to Mr. Brown, again, snooze fast. I fell asleep at least twice. It was warm out. I was sitting on the patio. I actually eventually just said, I'm just going to lay down and take a nap, because why am I faking it? Um, some people say, well, like we said, this is the office of the keys, the office of the holy ministry, Right? But as we said, the office of forgiveness, that belongs to everybody. Right? Everybody who's been received forgiveness has been authorized then to deliver forgiveness. The forgiveness of Jesus, right? What belongs particularly to the office of the ministry is the second half. Whoever sins you withhold, they are withheld. Or forgiveness you withheld, right? If you withhold forgiveness from any, they are, it is withheld. Right? That's a, that's a unique authorization um, to the church. This is how we say it as Lutherans. Again, other people have different nuance on this, but this is how we understand it. It's given to the church, normally exercised by her pastor, to say to someone, that thing that you continue to persist in, thing, thought, word, whatever it is, that you persist in, that God has clearly defined as sinful, and yet you refuse to acknowledge it as sin, it's now bound to you until you repent. Right? And that it has a formal name. We call it excommunication. Right? Um, in the Lutheran church, we have, we have the little excommunication and the big one. Sometimes it's called the major and the minor ban. Have you heard that? And it's not B-A-N. It's B-A-N-N. -N. Speaking of old English words that I don't know what they mean. Do you know about the marriage bans? Oh, we have to tell Elsie to do this. Ah. Uh, the marriage bans. Um, it was required in most, at least in most uh, German princedoms, I guess, or whatever they call them, territories. What they call them? Territories. Um, that you had to announce uh, an engagement to marriage at least two weeks before the marriage. And then the pa so the pastor would announce the same thing we, we hear now in the ceremony. If anyone has anything opposed to this, da 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 da, speak now or forever hold your peace. But it wasn't done at the ceremony because that would be a little bit. I mean, think about it. It's kind of stupid. Like, who's going to stand up in the middle of the ceremony and say, cut it out! You know, she's actually previously married to me and she's never divorced or something. I mean, so they would do it in the weeks leading up. What's that? I know it happens on movies, but I'm talking about real life. I don't know. Not ever, I think most people's life isn't like a Jerry Springer show. But maybe it is. Um, so they would do that two weeks ahead. You would have to, it, it's just an announcement, a ban. It's just an announcement to say, these two intend to be married on X and such, such and such day. If anyone has any opposition to this, speak now or forever hold your peace. Because what God has joined together, let not man separate, right? Um, so we have the major and the minor ban, which the, the minor ban is to say to someone, okay, the sin that you refuse to confess as sin, it's usually something that is public, so, like, people know about it. Or at least word has gotten around and it's become, becoming, or is, is, has become a scandal against 
Not just like a scandal that makes people uncomfortable, but a scandal against God's word, against Jesus. Does that make sense? So it's clearly against God's word. Everybody knows that, and yet they're persisting in it, right? So then uh, it's actually declared in the church, announced this person, to the person initially, minor, don't commune. Don't come to the Lord's table until this is reconciled, until we, you two who are at odds with each other, you know, this is why we do the peace of the Lord, right? Is that there's, it's just like the marriage ban. If anybody's opposed to communing together, now's your chance, all right? I was waiting for a fight to break out, right? Because then we have to go and we have to forgive before we can move on with the rest of the service. Seriously, if you've got a beef with somebody, go, go start punching them or something so that I can, we can get involved and we can clear the, clear the air. Uh, get some forgiveness applied. I mean, the church is not as nearly as interesting as it could be. I'm saying that I would enjoy it. I don't know if I would, but I'm always waiting for the big disruption, you know, not the kids making noise or something, like a real disruption. No, I'm not going to, no, I don't create crises. We don't need a crisis. It's okay. <laughs> but anyway, no, that's what that's about. It used to be a kiss because you couldn't kiss somebody unless you were actually like, I mean, you're not going to kiss an enemy, right? Or somebody you've got a beef with. I think you still shake their hand, but you'll do it. Can I have your hand? You'll be like, Arr! like, that's not really peace, is it? <laughs> yeah, break the fingers. Tight grip. Firm, but not tight. Okay. Thanks, Gabe. Um, okay, so that's minor ban. Major ban is to actually publicly declare before the church. Because this person has consistently, or people have consistently persisted in error, refusing to repent according to God's word, um, they are hereby excommunicated, which sounds so terrible. It just means they've declared themselves by their actions, words, or thoughts. I don't know about their thoughts. Actions or words. I don't know what they're thinking. Actions or words outside the fellowship of, of this church. They no longer believe what we believe, and we're just declaring that publicly. It sounds really terrible, but it's actually just being honest, right? And it forces the person to think a little bit more honestly about themselves. It's like, is this really the right church for me? I've had this happen where I excommunicated someone. Well, they excommunicated themselves. I declared it. They said, we're not coming anymore. So then I told the church they're not coming anymore <laughs> because they wanted to live in adultery and I told them to cut it out. So they found a church that said adultery is okay. And they went there. I mean, I don't think Jesus is happy with that. Um, but I was like, I'm, what else am I going to do? If they can find a, a church, it happened to be an Episcopalian, if they can find an Episcopalian church where they're like, hey, you guys love each other. It doesn't matter that you're both inf you know, living in infidelity to your marriages. And then, Oh, did they excommunicate somebody? Oh, that's too bad. I needed a story. Yeah. 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 You want to talk about the most unpopular thing to tell to... I mean, because here's the problem. Here's what's happened in my experience with this. Every single time, the problem isn't with the kids. It's always the parents. The kids will cut it out. All they, were, all they needed is their parents to say, cut it out. But the parents are the ones who say, hey, how about we like, give you money for a down payment so you can buy a house and you can figure this all out and get everything all lined up and then you'll have, you'll have your dog and everything will be perfect. And then you'll get married. I'm like, well, and then, then they're like, well, but... But they'll, you know, they'll be chaste and decent. They won't, they won't live as if they're married couples. And you're like, what world do you live in? Really? Hmm? Yeah. Or how about this? I marry you right now. Yep. And then mom and I can save thousands of dollars on the way. Or we can have a ceremony later, right? <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. This is 100% of the time, from, in my experience. I don't know if it's always the case, but 100% of the time, all it would have taken is the parents to just put their foot down and say, that's dumb, don't do it. What are you, idiots? I mean, why would you, why would you do such a thing? Of course, this is a really big topic. Um, I've also had it on the other end of the spectrum with older couples because they wanted to maintain their wealth they didn't want to join their estates together because then you end up paying more in taxes. So then they live together as husband and wife, but they're not husband and wife because they don't, they don't want to combine their estate. They're like, they end up second marriages or whatever, a widow or whatever, right? And I get that on the other, and they wanted to be companions. Um, 
But I mean, just use the example of my own grandfather, you know, when he remarried after my grandmother's death. Um, no, they got married and they went on a honeymoon and they, they lived as a married couple. That's what they did. It's like, yeah, we're, it was mostly like they didn't want to be alone, but that's actually one of the gifts of marriage, isn't it? This companionship? It's not good for man to be alone. Think about it. I mean, almost always, this is, okay, I shouldn't speak so definitively. Frequently, we'll just put it that way. Frequently, if, especially if the woman dies first, the man always follows within a year or so. They just, they just, you got this? You figured it out? We, we were to a wedding, I was home, mm. and I was at the after your wedding, I said, after, I was waiting for you to ask the question. Oh. He said, what question? I said, is there any reason why this couple should not be married? He says, we don't do things like that down here. He says, that is embarrassing to the people. I said, well, maybe the embarrassment will save them here. Ah, sometimes, yeah. Because that's maybe unrepentant sin, right? He, yeah. he actually got mad at me. Yeah. He says, I don't want to hear you anymore. Yeah. Um, I've had, I mean, I've had all sorts of wisdom given to me. I've never had to put into practice, but things like pastors taking, um, actually this happened in Chicago, you know, where they, they, they had space in the basement. It was a big house, right? Space in the basement, put up. Um, it, would have, it was going to be the um, groom-to-be, right? Put him up for however much time they needed, you know. He was paying for her to live in an apartment because she needed a place to live, but then he was living with the pastor until, until their marriage, and then they moved in together. So the pastor provided away. I mean, I probably not real keen on that. Our house is a little bit. It's not. It's not as tight as the parsonage would have been, but it's pretty tight still. Yeah, it's still full. Thanks. There's always room for one more. So, so I get. I again, I think it's just a matter of one saying, "Look, God's word matters, right? Don't live as if you're married. If you're not married, that's just simple. It's a, you know, sixth commandment: just chasing decent lives." And what you say and do. Then there's Elsie. Very strange. She's always over at his his house. But that's a pastor family. I suppose it's fine. I guess I don't know. She's there all the time. <laughs> Who knows? Not all the time. I don't even know. Same as us. They have a lot. They have a, they have what? The oldest daughter's moved out, right? She's married. Or has kids or something. Yeah. yeah. All right. Anyway, I should know. I, I don't. I can't keep track of their names. I, have this, I can't keep track of my own kids' names. I can tell which ones are mine, though. That part I can figure out. All right. I think we, I think we kind of uh, we got through that. Now, Thomas, one of, one of the 12, called Didymus, or the twin, which is always interesting, because who's his twin? How about this? You're his twin. Oh. I may say that for a sermon sometime. I use that in a sermon? Ah. Okay. You won't remember it next year. Yeah, you're his twin. Right? Yeah. Blessed are you. Because uh, it's, well, in, in Greek, there is no capitalization. It's, it's all capitalized. But who is known? Hall uh, legomenos didymos. Right, it it does come off sounding like a title. The tw- there's no there's no article though. Oh no, it is there. It's capitalized because there's a title. The twin, ha oh, legamos. So there's a proper article right before it. The. It's not right before it. Greek word order is different than English. That's why I got thrown off. But anyway, uh, who was not there with them when Jesus came? Okay. So the other disciples told him. Notice what they tell him. Not we have heard the Lord, but we have seen the Lord. Yeah. But what does he lack? Hearing. Hearing. No, he needs the word too. Yep. Uh, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, again, unless I see his hands, in his hands, the mark of the nails, and stick my finger into the mark of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side. I don't, I don't know why English, they always make it sound a little less dramatic. It's, it's pretty dramatic language. It's thrust my hand into his side. I will never, ever believe. I think it's pre- emphatic denial. Yeah, ume, I will never, ever believe. Okay then, Thomas. Right. 
Now, I mean, I think I said in the sermon this year, I don't know, it's been a few weeks now, you know, I, I, Thomas isn't wrong. We, we make Thomas into the doubting Thomas. He's the bad guy, right? How dumb. Thomas, how doubt you? Why did you doubt? I was like, actually, he's just asking the same thing that we all want, which is verifiable proof that Jesus has risen from the dead. And what do we have? Verifiable proof that Jesus has risen from the dead. We have eyewitness testimony who saw it, who saw him, right? Like Thomas, right? So we can give thanks to God for Thomas, which is how Dr. Nagel said it. Yeah, you, I thank God for Thomas. You said that doubting is wrong. It's actually a gift from God. Did I say that? Oh, I did say that. Doubt. You remember it? I am impressed. <laughs> I don't remember it. How do you remember? No, it's true. I did say that. It was just a couple weeks ago. Doubting is a gift, right? I said, yeah, if it's used for faith, it's a gift. If it's used uh, for unbelief, then of course it's not a gift, right? I mean, the doubt itself isn't, isn't unbelief. It's just why, what do you do with it, right? I, I, and I draw the ana- uh, analogy to anger, right? Jesus says, be angry, but do not sin. We're like, well, wait a minute. I thought anger was wrong. Not always. It's just what do you do with it, right? Where do you put it? Right? So if you doubt, what do you do? Search for evidence. Right? If you doubt um, that God loves you, what do you do? Read the Bible. Yeah, read what he did for you. <laughs> right? use, use that doubt to drive you uh, to where faith is given. Right? I, I guess that's, that seems obvious to me now that I said it in a sermon, but I don't think I ever said it before. So there we go. The problem with preaching, I'll just, I'm going to tell you all this because, you know, you're, what do you want to say? hardcore <laughs> sermon listeners, I guess. I don't know. Diehards. diehards, that's better. Diehards is better than hardcore. High card, hardcore diehards. I like that. I don't even know what that means. So is that you're always, you're always trying to run up as far as you can to the edge of things without going so far as that people are like, you end up back around the other side of it. Because, you know, I you get driven down into like fear, 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 but you don't want to, you don't want to end up on the backside where you're like, wow, pastor really made me terrified. You want people to come out the other side saying, thank you. Jesus sets aside fear. He's overcome death, et cetera. You know, some of that has to do with proportions, but some of it just has to do with placement. But I think also just rec- well, and you can't control it either because people are in different places. I mean, most of our congregation based off of your behavior not all that terribly fearful today compared to your neighbors, right? You walk around the neighborhood, and you, not, not so much in random, but go down to Grafton or something, you know? And there's like, they've got three masks on and, and they'll stand 20 feet away from you. And you're like, what's wrong with you? We're outside. Have you read the data? Well, why would I read the data? The experts say. It's like, if the experts aren't saying what the data bears witness to, then are they experts anymore? It's kind of like a pastor saying, this is what God's word says, but it's not actually what the word says. So are they actually a pastor now? Faithful preacher. Not unless they're saying what Jesus said, right? Okay. Anyway. Experts, experts would be false witnesses. False witnesses. They're expertly false witnesses? <laughs> Dr. Fauci hasn't practiced medicine for 40 years. I don't know what he's an expert at. Anybody know? Not to pick on anybody in particular. In theory, in theory, I think he's, I think he's actually an expert on um, how to raise money with vaccines, how to make money with vaccines and, and other medical treatment. No, I'm serious. No, I mean, he, he stands to make a lot of money. That's what NIID does, is they do disease research in order to develop medicines to treat them. That's what they do. So, yeah, that's just fair enough. Well, but then, you know, anyway. It's just like Bill Gates, he's an expert in vaccines. You're like... Actually, I think he was kind of an expert in running a software company, but whatever. I mean, everybody has different interests. Like, I'm not an expert in science, but I have a basic understanding of science that sometimes I speak about it, maybe too much. Okay, back to this. (laughs) Speaking of, eight days later, this is key. We didn't mention this before. We got to scroll back up. All right, we got 10 minutes. Good. We can get through this. Where's my cursor? There it is. Notice, on the evening of... That day, and then John gives us this note. The first day. first day of the week. So it's the beginning of a new week. It's supposed to be the week of the resurrection, but what are the disciples doing? 
hiding in fear for lack of belief in the resurrection. Okay? So it's no coincidence that when Didymus comes, Mr. Thomas, later that day, or I guess the next day or something, whenever it was, he doesn't believe either. But then notice, eight days later, eight days later, which makes it the first day of the? Next week. week. Very good. Still, we're now the second week of the resurrection, and they're still not believing. They're still locked away. Even though they said peace, and he's like, we've seen the Lord, and yet they're still... So, um, so a lesson to be learned here, I think, is that especially as you would speak God's word to people, teach it to the children, um, me as a a preacher, you know, pastor, teacher to the congregation, recognize that I have to say things probably a few times before they sink in, and even more so before um, the flesh gets out of the way and lets the Spirit do the job that He's promised. I'll just put it that way, right? So this is always the problem for pastors because we want to see a congregation full of peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, love. What did I miss? Humility. I don't know. Just pick all the, the godly virtues, right? The, we want, yeah. I wonder where they got the, the five codes. Maybe it's a distorted religion based on Christianity. He's talking about his martial arts. Um, no, I think it's based on Christian truth. Uh, what were you we saying? No, we want all of those things, right? But we also want it all and we want it now. You're like, no, I think you have to. Patience. Well, persistence, right? Uh, I'm trying to teach this to our, to our teachers in the day school. It's like, they're not going to get the catechism in year one. But start in year one and year two and year three and year four. Be persistent and patient with them. And having hearing, hearing it, hearing you confess it, maybe you do it with songs, I don't know, however you want to do it, it will, it will grow, right? But you have to plant the seed and you have to nurture it, to use the biblical analogy. That's the whole point of a Christian school. It is the point of a Christian school, I think. Yeah, it's, 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 if you want to use the negative term, it's indoctrination, although I, think I like to use it because I don't care, because that's what we do. We put the doctrine in kids. That's what we do. Yeah, it's not negative, it's a positive <laughs> This is which doctrine, right, is the key. Don't put the wrong doctrine in the kids, right? Yeah. At least. Oh, at least, yeah. Yeah, because you, cause your thinking muscle has gotten a little bit tired. Yeah. It's called your brain. No, I agree. Um, so, they, so that's, again, don't fault Thomas too much. But eight days later, or the other disciples. Um, notice it's Sabbath day, Sabbath day. Sunday, Sunday. So I would suggest that what John is doing here is he's showing us, both now and especially in chapter 21, which we'll get to probably next time, um, is, is this is being preached and taught in the context of a Christian assembly. We talk about this with the book of Hebrews, right? A letter, like Paul's letter to Corinthians, which we did before Hebrews on our Wednesday night class, also read to the Christian assembly in the context of a divine service. That's what we do. John's preaching to people on a Sabbath day about what happens on Sabbath days. Jesus comes and says, peace to you. Peace be with you. Here's my hands. Here's my side. That's what he does every Sabbath day, doesn't he? You see the altar. Of, you see, he's actually, there's actually a statue with Jesus and he's got his, she's showing you. You can't show him his side because he'd have to be semi-naked for that to happen, I guess. Believe me, there's lots of people that talk about how it couldn't have been his side because then he would have not have any clothes on and you're like, oh my goodness. <laughs> These are people in ivory towers that have too much time on their hands. I, I like how it says they're inside, and it's the Sabbath. It's in their shirt, and they're yes. because they need God's Word. They're gathered around His Word again, and they're in, well, actually in need of God's Word again a week later. So again, the regular life of the Christian is, is, a, is a weekly Sabbath. I think, I think John has that in mind here, hence the eight days later. Plus, we hear this text the Sunday after Easter, eight days later, right, yeah. Uh, peace be with you. Hey, he said that before. Again, although the doors were locked. In case you missed it the first time, here it is again. Peace be with you. So now, how many times has he said that? This is now the third time in the story, right? Two times the week before. Now for the third time. Three is a good number, I think. Uh, then he said to Thomas, wait a minute. How did he know? Huh. Uh, Put your finger here and see my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. 
do not be, do not disbelieve, but believe. Now note, Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Again, what two words were put together here? Or what two things were put together, I should say. Peace be with you. See my hands and my side. Same thing with the rest of his disciples. He gave, he gave Thomas the exact same thing as the others. Thomas demanded more, but he didn't need more. Right? He had the same gift. The wounds and the word. The sign and the word. Uh, and, and it also doesn't say he actually touched Jesus at all. <laughs> didn't need to. He had the word. He had the sight. So. Although, all the artwork has him putting his finger. I like the Caravaggio. You know Caravaggio? He's actually like pulling the skin back with his finger on the side. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful painting. It really is. But he's like, he's like, he's up like this, and he's like, and he's pulling back the wound. <laughs> Lift high the cross. That's right. Okay. Um, Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Now this is beautiful too. Um, Curio and, Curios and, of course, Theos. Um, this is actually a, this is actually not a Hebrew greeting, like shalom, peace be with you. This is actually a Roman greeting. This is what you would say to a king. My Lord and my God. This is what you would say to Caesar, actually. But now Thomas is applying it to Jesus. Which fits really well within the whole narrative that we talked about, you know, was it two weeks ago now with Pontius Pilate. So you say you were a king. We did it in catechism this week, didn't we? That's why I'm confused. We did John 19 in catechism. Okay. Now I understand what, what happened. We went back to John 19 for their catechism. Yeah, my Lord and my God. Um, I forget what the Latin would be then. Dominus Regus, I think. Dominus Regus. Or Dominus, no, it would be God. What's God in Latin? Oh, Domini is, no, that's Lord. Isn't it? Oh, that's God. What's Lord then? Domini, Domini Deus, Deus, yeah. My Lord, my God. What? Okay. What are you doing to your hair? That's crazy. All right. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? And the answer is? Yes and no. Yes and no, right. Yes, I've seen you, but I've heard you, right? I have faith attached. Blessed are those, or happy, I like people who translate this as happy. Happy are those who have not seen and yet have believed, right? Now, have they seen? We've talked about this many times. Of course they have, right? But they didn't see with their eyes. They saw with their, yeah. So, so Thomas and the other, the 12, the apostle, apostolic band, they saw, not the 12, 11, sorry, no Judas. Um, they saw and they heard, and then now they testify to what they saw and what they heard. It all follows, right? I think so. Pretty straightforward. Right. It's helpful when you preach a text every year that when it comes time to study it, you can go read um, Mr. Brown and fall asleep. All right, and then we have the purpose statement. Uh, we'll just cover, we'll summarize it today and then we'll dig into it more because it'll lead us into the, what I would like to call the epilogue, chapter 21. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of, these disciple, of the disciples. We've talked about this so many times. I think I bring it up all the time. Which are not written in this book. Okay, so that means things, signs, with word attached, right? But these are written, these signs, if you would, if you would are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, that is the King, the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in His name. Um, English is terrible. <laughs> Sorry. Second person, okay, it's second person plural subjunctive. I guess you could translate it as may. Sometimes people say might have life in His name. Anybody have a different translation? You might have life. You may have life. We hear that subjunctive. Maybe you just say you will have life. You have life. Yeah, it's, it, has a, it has a future sense to it. Leah's right. That, it, that it, it's not as if you might, you may, it maybe. That's how we usually do subjunctive. Maybe. As in like there's some question. There's no question here. Uh, Greek subjunctive just doesn't translate well into English. Which is, so that by believing, I like Leah, just say you will have life in his name. You don't have life apart from him believing. That's why they use subjunctive. It is dependent upon the believing. 
okay? But believing you have, you will, you have, whatever, whichever tense you want to have. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, this happens to all the time in the church. I just drop them usually. May the Lord bless and keep you. I don't even say I don't say may. I just say the Lord bless and keep you. Because if I say may, people are like, well, maybe that's not for me. And you're like, no. No, I'm saying you have. He will. You have it now and he will. Well, anyway. All right. So that's, the, that's what we call the purpose statement. It would have been nice if he kind of put this at the beginning. Oh, wait. He did. Do you remember the beginning of the book? I'm going just a few minutes over. I got started a little late. It's a good enough excuse for me. I don't know if it is for you. Um, yeah, look, here. There's a couple of them here. Here's a purpose statement. To bear witness about the light. He was not the light. But he came to bear witness to the light. Here it is. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming to the world. Ah, here we go. He came to his own, verse 11, and his own people did not receive him. Here's the same purpose statement. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, there it is, he gave the right. Ah. Well, what word would you prefer? No, it's exousia. It's, it's, the, it's the authority to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of God, or man, but of God. Yeah, it's exousia. It's the word we usually translate as authority, right or permission or whatever. It is a gift. That's right. It's a gift word. It's not power. You can't make yourself a child of God. Okay. So it's the same. It's really the same. It's the dovetail. Bookends. Isn't that what we call it? He said, this is why this, is why this gospel is being written, that you would have life and, and by believing in his name, right? And be a child of God. And then at the end, he says, these things were written that you would believe and you'd have life in his name. Make sense? Yeah. All right. Good. So we'll do the uh, epilogue next time, which is chapter 21, which is kind of fun. Most people say that it's um, an, a later edition, but unlike the end of Mark, they don't actually attach it as an ending. So, all right, let's, uh, let's just say a word of blessing to leave. May the Lord bless us in our study, um, in his word, bless us in our life, uh, especially as his children, and that he would bless uh, all the vocations and estates he's placed us in, that our, our loving service to our neighbor would be a blessing to them. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, okay. That was a long service. I'm a little wiped. <laughs>